church. Scripture this morning is from Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 22. And when the days for their purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death until he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came into the temple, or he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, he took him in his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, thou dost let thy bondservant depart in peace according to thy word, for my eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared in the presence of all people, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel, and for a sign to be opposed, a sword will pierce even your own soul, to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with a husband seven years after her marriage, and then as a widow to the age of 84. And she never left the temple, serving night and day with fasting and prayers. And at that very moment, she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak of him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Can we pray together? Father, thank you for the example in in this passage about Simeon, a man who was looking for your coming. Thank you for the example of of Anna, who living so many years as a widow had devoted herself to prayer and fasting, looking for your coming. Lord, thank you for your consolation. Thank you that you heal us from grief you bring help in trouble. And Lord, even in the year ahead, we can look to you as the one who is our redeemer, who gives us purpose, who gives us hope, who gives us endurance in times of difficulty. And Lord, we just we're so thankful to be here with, with our church family, to worship you, to hear your word. Lord, I pray you'd speak through my brother Paul. Thank you for his willingness to just step in and bring a message to us that we can then share as good news to our neighbors, to people that we work with, to our family members, to our children and our grandchildren. Lord, we just love you. Thank you for this opportunity to be in your presence. In Jesus' name. Good morning. Merry Christmas. <laughs> uh, as you know, our uh, brother Pastor Chris and brother uh, Jacob, they are on the mend, but they are out sick. So I'm going to say hi to them and their families. Um, and so I am pleased to be here and to step in. Uh, what an opportunity uh, that God has given me to uh, just share a message that uh, I hope will bless you. Uh, But I do have to confess 
that my heart was not necessarily in the right place the whole time. Um, you know, when Chris first texted me earlier this week, and he said, you know, I'm not feeling very well. I've had chills and fever. My initial response was, okay, um, you know, I'm so sorry to hear about that. Get better. I'll go ahead and start preparing in case I need a cover for you. Well, the next day he's like, yeah, you know what? I'm not feeling well, and uh, I think you should go ahead and cover for me. And that's when it sunk in like, oh, I really do have to start, you know, preparing. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, it's Christmas, and so I was just like thinking about our traditions that we have as a family. Usually Christmas Eve, we get together at my brother's house, and we all hang out and open presents and eat. And then Saturday, I make pozole, and we just lounge around on the couch and uh, watch movies, play games. And so all of these things were kind of just starting to fill my mind and in my heart, and I was like... I'm kind of upset. I'm not going to get to do those things. So I, I had an, you know, it's confession. I had to deal with that, that in my head and wrestle that with my heart. But Friday morning came around and I was spending time with the Lord. I've been reading through a Bible that takes you through the entire Bible in a year. And so in the passage that I was reading that morning, I came across this verse from Psalm 143:12, And it says, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. And when I read that, it just pierced my heart to the point of where I was just crying because I was thinking, man, that's sad. I was wanting to choose my traditions and the things that we normally do over this opportunity to spend time in the word and read through this passage and ask God, how can I impart some kind of teaching to you? And I was really convicted by that. And in his gracious way that he always does, he changed my heart. And he changed it from this feeling of having to do something to getting to do something. So I praise God. And I want to encourage you because as you think about what 2022 may look like, you are going to have some agendas. You're going to have your traditions and you're going to have things happen, disrupt your normal way of life. And you're going to have to ask yourself, what kind of attitude will I have? Especially when you have opportunities to do things for the Lord. And this is going to be um, something that we, reading through this passage, can really think about and consider how Jesus lived his life. Um, when we read through Luke 2 beginning in verse 41, let's see if we can glean from Jesus what it looks like to be about God's business, to be in his father's house. It says there, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances, and when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We ask, Lord Jesus, by the gift of your Holy Spirit, that you would teach us from this passage, Lord. 
that we would understand in a greater measure what it means to be in our Father's house, what it means to be about you, God. And so we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So what did Jesus mean when he said that he must be in his Father's house? I mean, after all, Mary and Joseph were his parents, weren't they? Well, technically, they weren't. Mary was his mother, but Jesus, who was his father? God. Yes, Mary was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. She conceived Jesus. So in this very instance, Jesus is responding to Mary and Joseph and letting them know by his very own words who his father was. He was letting them know that he is indeed the son of God. And I think that the timing is not coincidental because if we look at verse 42 in that part that I read, it said that when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. Well, what custom was that? What custom is it that a 12-year-old goes through um, when they turn that age? Well, for the Jews, they see this as a time when that child has reached an age of accountability. There's a ceremony that they have, kind of a rite of passage, in which they recognize that that child now has the responsibility for his or her own life. They recognize that they have reached that biblical age of accountability. Some of you may have heard what this ceremony is. It's called a bar mitzvah. For a girl, it's a bat mitzvah. Bar, meaning son or boy, and bat, meaning girl. And mitzvah, meaning of the commandment. So you see, Jesus had gone through this ceremony, and Mary and Joseph leave. But Jesus does something very different, very unexpectedly. He stays behind. And Mary and Joseph go on their way and then realize he's not with them. They come back. Finally, after three days, they find him in the temple. And what does Jesus say? Is he distressed, by the way? No. Why is he not distressed? Because he's about his father's business. And we get to see this in full force. So while Mary and Joseph are off with their group, They're in great distress. They look for him for three days. How many of y'all have lost a child somewhere at the store or something? Now, minutes can seem like hours, and hours can seem like days, right? So can you imagine the turmoil that was going in Mary's heart as she was wondering where her lost son was? But when they arrive, they see Jesus. After three days, he ain't worried about it. He's doing the will of his Father. And so I see here in this passage a great example for us as we look into 2022 of what we can do to really be about our Father's business. And the first thing that we see as we look into verse 46, it says there that after three days they found him in the temple. And what was he doing? He was sitting among the teachers. Church. This is what we can do, just as Jesus did, is to sit among good teachers. And one of the best places that you can find yourself in doing that is spending time every day in the Word, just you and Jesus, reading the Word and allowing the Holy Spirit to teach you. Jesus understood the importance of being around good teachers. He went back to the temple, and around them were, what, rabbis, people who knew the scriptures and were able to teach him. And you might think to yourself, well, but he's Jesus. Doesn't he know everything? He's God. But yet he's setting such an amazing example for us. Another place that you can surround yourself and find your place sitting in is in our path groups. We have groups that meet throughout the week and we'll begin meeting again in January. And this is an opportunity for you to be able to sit amongst brothers and sisters, and to be able to dive into the Word, to allow that iron, to sharpen iron, to be able to fellowship, and to be able to glean from one another. And then, of course, there are Sunday services. We would love for you to faithfully be 
attending worship services every Sunday. I know that our crowd looks a little sparse. It's been Christmas, but I'm proud of y'all for being here this morning. Praise the Lord. What does it say there that Jesus is doing next? It says that he is listening to them. Ooh, listening to them. I think that's a, another thing that we can do as we look on to 2022 is that we can be good listeners. What does it look like to be a good listener? It's not just about hearing. It's about paying attention. And these days, it's really hard to pay attention. One of the greatest distractions that we have are our little handheld devices, right? That is a great distraction. And so what you can do is remove distractions. It's okay to turn off the phone. You can turn it off for a few minutes and spend time in the Word. Practically speaking, you can also uh, look and identify that place that allows you to be still. Find that time of the day where it's quiet, where you can be alone with the Lord, free from those distractions. And then one of the other great um, challenges we have is, is not being a person who interrupts. Now, I know that that is really hard for us because our minds go so fast. But I'm not even talking about interrupting vocally. I'm talking about interrupting in our minds and in our hearts where we're not giving somebody the full attention because we're already thinking about what they're implying or what you would like to say before they even finish their thought. Jesus was a very good listener and what it did was it opened him up to asking good questions. And that's what we can do as well. We can learn to ask questions. How many of y'all have been in those group settings where you're like not quite understanding maybe that material or whatever they're talking about and, and you're just kind of sitting there going, I hope somebody else asks that question because I don't want to ask it because I, I feel like that's a dumb question. There's no dumb questions. You want to ask those questions. So there are some barriers, though, that keep us from asking questions. One of them is pride, right? We, wanna, we don't want to look like we don't know what, or that we should, we should know what a particular passage means. There's no dumb questions. Uh, another thing is you might be embarrassed. Like, oh, am I, did, I, did he just say it? You know, am I asking that a, que a question that he just went over? Well, that might happen, but you don't want to miss out on that teaching, so don't be embarrassed. And ultimately, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to ask those questions. There's so many blessings that comes from asking questions. As we looked at Jesus and his life, when he asked those questions, what did it do? Oftentimes, it revealed the heart of the matter. It revealed the heart of the person. And that's what we want to ultimately um, do, is we want to know God's heart. We want to know who Jesus is in a more intimate way. And the, real, the way we're going to do that is if we ask those hard questions, God is faithful to give us those answers. So there are three verses that I thought about in regards to, you know, sitting among good teachers and being a good listener and asking those questions. That first one for sitting among good teachers from Proverbs 13, 20, it says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise but the companion of fools suffers harm. Find yourself in good company. Walk with the wise so that you may become wise. In terms of being a good listener, I thought of Job 34, 2 through 3. It says, Hear my words, you wise men, and give ear to me, you who know, for the ear tests words as the palate tastes food. In this particular passage, if you ever have read through the book of Job, you see that he has some friends that have much to say and are not very good listeners. And Elihu says this verse here, and it's not until after all the other guys have expressed their thoughts about the situation. Now, Elihu was the youngest, but you could see that there was already great wisdom in this man and that he was a, first a listener, and then he brought his statements to them. And then in terms of regarding the asking of questions, it says, 1 Peter 5, 5, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. 
Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. It takes a lot of humility to ask those questions. It might make you embarrassed or, uh, you know, just being afraid. But in humility, God is gracious to us. And so when I think about, uh, you know, that day when Jesus is finally found, and in that year, his 12th year, you know, we read several times, not just in this passage, but in other passages, how Mary, she treasured up all these happenings in her life. And I imagine it must have been such a great challenge for her to see her little boy growing up because she cared and she protected and she loved him. But yet she was constantly being reminded that he was so much more than just her little boy. He was the savior of the world. So we know that in this story, he's already revealing to Mary what everybody else in his, her past has been saying, what Elizabeth recognized, what um, Anna says, what Simeon says. Now he is telling her, and she's having to come to terms with that, and she treasures these things in her heart. Now we as a church, we're on the other side of this story because we know what happens in Jesus' life, that he grows up to be a man, that he goes to the cross and he dies for the sins of the world, but he doesn't stay dead. In three days, he rises again and he is now alive forevermore. And so now we get to experience a life with that understanding. And in that, we don't lose hope. We too have an opportunity to treasure things in our own hearts. They're a little different now because we know that Jesus has risen. But what can we treasure in our heart as we move into 2022? Well, let's consider this scripture together from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And it says here, beginning in verse 13, it says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. These are some awesome verses for us to treasure up in our heart. These promises have been given to us, and so how can we keep those as we move into this new year that will definitely bring about distractions, that will definitely bring about opportunities where you will have to choose whether you will serve God first or yourself? Well, I think we can look back at Simeon and Anna uh, for some examples, from some, for some teachable lessons for us to consider as we think about uh, how we can treasure these things in our heart. In Luke 2.25, we read that Simeon was a devout man. So what does this word devout mean? It comes from the Greek word eulabis, and it means to take hold of well, carefully and surely. Hebrews 10.23 says, Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So I want to encourage you, church, to hold fast to your confession of Jesus Christ, to hold fast to those verses from 1 Thessalonians. I know that many of you have lost loved ones, but as the word tells us for those who are in Christ Jesus, They're just asleep, and we're going to see them again. 
we can also, as we learn from Anna, remain steadfast and faithful. In Luke chapter 2, verses 36 through 37, we read that Anna, for decades, did not depart from the temple, but rather she worshiped with fasting and prayer night and day. That's a pretty high bar that's been set. But we can definitely move in the direction of a greater devotion to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Galatians 6, 9 tells us, let us not grow weary in doing well, for in due time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Oh, imagine that time when Simeon finally gets to see Jesus in the flesh, or when Anna finally sees all those years of devotion have come to fruition. Church, we too, let us not give up. Let us hold fast to that confession as we await for the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes, on that 12th year of Jesus' life on earth, it was no ordinary year. And for Mary and Joseph, they, they had to wrestle with the reality of many many hard things, things that I think we probably can't even begin to imagine. In Luke 2, 34, we read that Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and the sword will pierce through your own soul also so that the thoughts for many hearts may be revealed. I couldn't help but wonder that could those three days when they had lost their son, Jesus, those three days of just her in turmoil, wondering what could have happened to my son, and then finally on that third day finding him and seeing him being exactly where he was supposed to be and alive and well how maybe that was just a foreshadowing of the pain that she was going to have to experience one day when she would see her son on the cross. And that after three days of anguish and pain as she goes to see her son, Jesus, and anoint him, she finds out he's not there, for he's risen. That must have been really hard for Mary to have pondered in her heart. But we can rejoice that when she came back on that third day to that tomb, that it was empty. So it brings me to this conclusion. Some of you may leave today supposing that Jesus is with you because you've attended this worship service. But until you truly place your faith in Jesus Christ, until you recognize that you're a sinner in need of a Savior, you will go about your business, and Jesus will still be about his, but you'll go in separate ways. It doesn't have to be that way, though. Today, I want to invite you to take him with you. So if you've not placed your faith in Jesus Today is the day of salvation. Let's all pray together. God, you know who in this room has not believed in your son and placed their faith completely in him. And this is an opportunity, God, that you have given them to settle it once and for all in their hearts and to acknowledge that they are a sinner in need of a Savior. And that Savior is your Son, Jesus Christ, who came into this world, who lived a life in complete obedience to you and died on the cross for all of our sins and who now lives and reigns with you, God. Oh, Father God, I pray that if there's anyone in this room who has struggled with believing 
and trusting completely in who you are. May their hearts be open to your truth and may they be saved. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So kind of bringing it back around to that first verse from Psalm 143, 12, where it says, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on ground level. Well, what I didn't share with you is that even as God foreknew that Chris and, and Jacob would be ill and that things would have to be different today, um, he was already putting things in motion to allow us to still celebrate some of our traditions that I wouldn't have known or recognized until this time. So a few weeks ago, my wife, Ceci, said, you know, I really want to just have our family, um, which is she and I and our three children, together for Christmas Eve, which was something different. And I know that, um, you know, as our children are growing and they're so busy working and one of them lives now in San Antonio, I just recognize that she really treasures us being able to be together. So, so I said, yeah, let, let's do that. We'll just change, see if we can change the plans for meeting with my brother and, and their family. And so in doing that, that pushed back our gathering to this afternoon. So even Saturday, it was completely free because God said, you need to be in my word and prepare. So I ask you, church, when somebody asks where you are, will the first thought that comes to their mind be, oh, they're about their father's business, they're in their father's house. And that can be true wherever you go because Jesus lives in you. So go with the Lord, happy new year. We look forward to 2022.